The following account is real. Names have been changed to protect the living and the innocent. This journal contains language and content that may not be suitable for all listeners. The last two weeks were a nightmare. I'm more tired than I've ever been, and all I want to do is clock out at five and enjoy my first full weekend off in a month. But it's five o'clock, and I'm on my way to pick up a 700-pound man with the funeral director I can tolerate the least. Thank God it's Friday, right guys? My name is Grant, and these are my funeral home stories. Chapter 8, My 700-Pound Body. It's 4.45 p.m. on the second Friday in October. I'm turning off the remaining lights in the chapel, lobby, and visitation areas and locking the front and side doors of the funeral home. I'm 21 years old, and in 15 minutes I'll be off for the entire weekend, and my girlfriend, Mary, is driving over from her all-girls college to get drunk and play Guitar Hero 2 all night. I'm planning on blowing off a lot of steam this weekend. It couldn't have come at a better time because I'm completely burnt out. I covered for Alan last weekend. He's another gopher like me at the funeral home, except he's in his 40s and has a wife, two kids, and a dog. He was a poli-sci major in college, and through a series of careers, odd jobs, and layoffs, Alan found himself here, with us. At our funeral homes and crematory, we have on-call teams consisting of two people, one director, one assistant. At the moment, there are only four of us. We're in the process of hiring some new people, but that's taking forever. We've been pretty short-staffed after Lindsay was fired and Brian and Steve left in the first quarter of last year. We've also had a few gophers that couldn't cut it, but we're not missing much in their absence. We had this one guy who went to a single car fatality on his first or second night on and didn't show up to work the next day. <laughs> one car accident is enough to shake you? What an asshole. Who signs up for this job and doesn't expect to see some blood and guts poured all over the pavement every now and then? When I was 16 years old, I didn't quit my job after I saw a family of three and their pet dog ripped to pieces on the freeway by a semi. But maybe I should have. That call still makes me sick to my stomach, but that's what I signed up for. My dad never pushed me into making removals. I mean, I never really objected. It's how my family makes money. We pick up bodies in whatever condition we find them, and we get compensated for it. Obviously, I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but it's easy to burn the candle at both ends. The bottom line is, if we don't hire more people, one of us is definitely going to die around here. Well, I suppose we're all going to die, but you get what I'm trying to say. I wonder which one of us will die first. I hope it's not me, but at the rate I'm going, it very well could be. So far, this has been the most agonizing and exhausting week I've had at the funeral home. I couldn't imagine being any more tired than I am today. It all started last week when Alan took the weekend off plus Monday to take his wife and kids to Universal Studios, where you can ride the movies and also leave your coworkers picking up your slack because you wanted to have a healthy family life and time to yourself to relax. <laughs> where does Alan think he works? The mall? Okay, I may still be carrying a little resentment for the grueling week I just had. I made six after-hours removals last week and worked four visitations and three services. 40 hours Monday through Friday and funerals and visitations are nothing. It's the late-night wake-ups and death-call road trips that get you. But time and a half is nice. It's kind of strange, but my stomach flips almost every time my phone rings now. That's a Pavlovian response, right? Anyway, I was on call Friday through Tuesday along with my regular day Thursday, so that's five on, one off. Basically, I only had Wednesday night off this week. Yay. What a fun night to have off. It may seem like I'm complaining, but when most of your week is spent rushing from a dead body in a house to a funeral service to a dead body hanging in a tool shed to a visitation to another dead body with his brain splattered on a county road at all hours of the night, the lack of sleep can really wear you down. But we're only talking about sleep right now. There are so many ways to properly fuel and replenish a human body that's been sleep deprived and overexerted. Perhaps like eating well to offset the lack of sleep to nourish my immune system to stay healthy. What a concept. Well, don't worry. My diet, along with my sleep, has completely gone to shit. I haven't sat down and had a proper home-cooked meal in about two weeks. I have, on the other hand, eaten a surprising amount of gas station sandwiches. To dehydrate myself and stay awake, I drink loads of caffeine and occasionally dabble in other varying stimulants. But that's mostly during my recreational time, if you catch my drift. I feel like I might be getting sick, or 
Wait, did I mention that I drank an entire $9 bottle of vodka on Wednesday night to celebrate my first night off in five days and have been nursing an awful hangover for the last two days? That also may be a contributing factor in my fatigue. The remnants of my headache finally faded to nothing at lunch this afternoon. That was nice. To put it plainly, I'm not quite the beacon of health I was a year ago when I had time for things like P90X and, well, not eating out of a garbage can. So, something happened yesterday that I'm not proud of. I was just too tired to keep it together. I was sitting in my car in a doctor's office parking lot, waiting for a death certificate to be signed, eating one of those barbecue sandwiches from the gas station that's meat patty is shaped like ribs and slathered in barbecue sauce, when a giant glob of brown syrupy sauce slid from the bottom of the sandwich onto my brand new Express Men's white fitted dress shirt I just picked up last week. Fuck, I was so mad. The shirt was ruined, and when I went to wipe the sauce off with a napkin, I felt something awful. Something my 21-year-old body and brain was unfamiliar with and absolutely unequipped to process at that moment. I felt the beginnings of a pooch. Feeling my new layer of belly fat smushed together by my posture in the driver's seat, paired with the exhaustion and absurdity of my week, I just stared at myself in the rearview mirror and cried while holding a barbecue rib sandwich. I wasn't crying because I was sad, I was crying because I felt completely trapped, stuck grinding day in and day out for no great purpose, just cleaning up after dead people and getting fat in the process. I wish someone had taken a picture of me in that moment. It would have made a great ad for that gas station sandwich. Well, yesterday was a weird day, but I didn't get called out last night, so I actually got about six hours of sleep. It was amazing, but I'm definitely irritable and my stomach is a little upset. Probably that last rib sandwich. I had one left over from yesterday, so I had it for lunch. They're two for two twenty-two. I'm not gonna not buy two. What am I? A monster? All the lights are off in the funeral home now. I pick up the phone at the front desk and dial the answering service. I tell Denise, the pleasant voice on the other end of the phone, that I'm leaving for the night and they've got it from here. It's finally over. Thank God. Oh, I need to clock out. My girlfriend Mary texts me. Can't wait to see you tonight. I missed you. I get a little pep in my step as I enter the stairway containing the time clock for two reasons. One, it's almost time to go home, and two, it just feels nice when somebody you like likes you back, you know? To be honest, I'm just excited I don't have to see another dead body until Monday. That sounds weird. Sliding my time card out of its slot, I hear the phone ring once, ending abruptly mid-ring. This means someone called the funeral home and almost instantaneously was transferred to a call center two towns away. I really don't understand how this works. I'm not a phone scientist. Okay, great, I say to myself. The answering service is on. I won't have to call in the parking lot on the way out to my car. We always double check the phones before we leave. It was never really a requirement until Ned forgot to turn on the phones one night and the answering service called my dad at 11 p.m. to see if we were still in the office. We didn't lose any business, but we could have. Imagine the funeral home you trust to be there in your time of need and when you call the phone just rings and rings and rings. That's a bad look. The time clock ticks over from 4.59 to 5. I slide my time card into the large green wall mounted time clock to hear the most satisfying chunk sound. This sound echoes through my brain. It signifies my freedom from this place. It signifies my end of watch this week. The loud thud of the clock signifies that in less than 15 minutes, I will be making drink number one with my dog Carter and awaiting the arrival of my beautiful girlfriend Mary for a night of binge drinking and Guitar Hero 2. Our playing gets a little sloppy by the end of the evening, but that's rock and roll, I guess. I arm the security system and lock the giant glass back door and walk to my car. Oh my god, it's so nice out. I stop halfway between my car and the funeral home. The wind blows and the crunchy fall leaves rustle against the pavement. After a large gust, it's silent. No cars, no air conditioners, no people. Everything is completely still. Normally I don't think I would acknowledge the stillness because I'd be in too much of a hurry, but this is the first time I haven't felt sick or completely sweaty and delirious from sleep deprivation all day. So I'm going to enjoy this stillness and be completely alone and content in this parking lot for a second. My stomach growls. I'm not sure if it's anxiety or if it's my stomach excitingly reminding me to go home and fill it with booze and diet soda, or perhaps it's my intestines wanting to rid my body of the fourth gas station sandwich I had this week. By the tone and depth of my stomach rumble, I would say it's the latter. 
I realize I sound like a human garbage disposal right now, but they're convenient, and some days the last thing I want to think about is what I'm going to eat. Oh, oh well. Back to enjoying this moment of stillness by myself. My phone rings. The caller ID on my Nokia 6070 says it's Andy, the director on call this weekend. Not really sure why he'd be calling me. He knows I'm off this weekend and it would be a real dick move of him to call and ask for something right at 5 o'clock. But it's Andy. He generally only calls if he needs you to do something for him that's super inconvenient for you. My calmness immediately turns back into agitated tension. I answer the phone and immediately tell Andy that I just turned over the phones and I'm getting into my car. He pauses for a moment as if he knows the information he's about to give me is going to irritate me. I'm very aware of his pregnant pause and I'm already irritated before he even begins his next sentence. Andy proceeds. Alan's kid broke his arm and is in the ER. Okay, not sure where he's going with this. I need you to go on a call with me. It's 40 minutes away and we have to get moving now while people are still at the house. Meet me at the crematorium 5 and I'll explain on the way. Okay, I say and dig my phone sharply into the end button of my phone terminating our conversation abruptly. Fucking Alan and his clumsy ass kid. Of course, dude goes to Universal Studio and fucks around for a week and then flakes on his first weekend back on call. Am I dreaming right now? Did I fall asleep inside the funeral home and this is some sort of never ending funeral industry specific nightmare? I take a breath. I'm not dreaming. I get into my maroon Pontiac Grand Dam and drive to meet Andy at the crematory. Why wouldn't he take two minutes and tell me what we're doing? Why does he do that? I don't want to be surprised. I want to be home with my dog and my girlfriend. My stomach rumbles again, but this time it's louder. So it's definitely the gas station sandwiches, I guess. I'm eventually going to have to deal with this hmm, stomach issue, but there's no time now. Gotta drive. I'm so tired. The sun is beating in through my windshield, making the glare unbearable on the mile and a half drive to the crematory. The hangover headache I thought I had under control at lunch was coming back. I searched for sunglasses, but I must have left them at home. I slow down as I pull up to the crematory. Andy's waiting for me in the van outside. We make eye contact and he waves with a big stupid grin on his face. I park my car and hop in the van. We're driving now. Andy seems to be in a hurry. We have a 40 minute drive ahead of us and apparently he's trying to make it in 20 minutes. Generally, I'm a nervous passenger when people drive like assholes, but I'm supposed to be off right now and I'm becoming more exhausted and apathetic the farther we get from the funeral home. Andy could drive this van into a tree right now and I probably wouldn't even brace myself. Maybe he will. Then we won't have to go on this call. The first thing I noticed when I got into the van with Andy was the lack of a traditional stretcher for our death call. In place of the stretcher was a giant rectangular cardboard box top and a heavy duty wooden box base. These are the boxes we use to ship caskets with or without bodies on commercial flights. You heard me right. We ship bodies on commercial flights. You'd probably be surprised by the number of dead bodies mixed in with your luggage on any given flight. I mean, if I told you there was a dead body laying directly below you on your next flight, that would be enough to surprise you, right? Maybe not. Andy, why do we have a shipping container in the van? Well, Grant, it's because... Andy pauses and looks down at a crumbled piece of paper with scribbles for a name. It's because our guy, Mr. Ross, is very large and won't fit onto a normal stretcher. I look at Andy for a second. Like, how big? 400 pounds? Nope. Andy responds, unable to hide the grin, taking up more and more real estate on his face. He's just under 700 pounds. What? 700 pounds? How the fuck are two of us gonna move a 700 pounder? I'm strong, but I'm not sumo wrestler strong. Andy, we can't do this alone. Andy interrupts me and says there are about 15 people at the house waiting for us, hence the rush. They've got an electronic overhead lift and apparently they cut a hole in the side of his double wide trailer to help us get him out. We'll put the container's wood base on a heavy accordion type church truck, use their lift to move the body onto the wood panel and cover him with the tall cardboard top before we move him outside. His friends and family have already said they'll help us load him into the van and our hydraulic lift back at the crematory will help us get him out and we'll be able to cremate in two days when we get the death certificate signed by his doctor. A 700 pound man being cremated? I've cremated enough bodies to know that that much fat under direct flame is going to burn like a tiki torch and a grease fire put together. It's gonna be hot. Andy's plan sounds pretty simple and his forethought eases my anxiety, but we hit a bump getting onto the highway and I felt the contents of my stomach swirl around like thick bubbling lava. <sighs> I wish I had some Tums. My stomach is a mess right now. Every five or ten minutes, it reminds me with a growl that it's holding on to something it doesn't want to. That fourth 
barbecue rib sandwich. I think about what it would be like to be 700 pounds. How many barbecue sandwiches would I need to eat every day to get that big? At least 10, right? I poke the pooch that I notice forming on my belly and it doesn't seem as big as it did yesterday after hearing about our 700 pound fella, but it's tender to the touch. Like, really tender. I feel a bead of sweat run down my back under my shirt. I turn the AC on high. Do I have a fever or the barbecue rib sandwich sweats? Thinking about Andy's plan, I look at the container in the back of the van, which is big enough to ship a casket, and wonder out loud how our 700 pound man will fit, or if he'll even fit at all. I mean, the box is wide, but I have no idea how wide a 700 pound person is. Andy tells me not to sweat it, he'll fit. Andy has made a lot of removals of people this size throughout his career, so I'll trust he knows what he's doing. I've only made a few removals with Andy, and he's never usually this confident. In fact, from my experience, he mostly lets you do all the work and eats your candy bars while you're carrying his dead weight around. Mary texts me. She'll be over around 7. Yes, something to look forward to to take my mind off my fatigue and anger from being forced to go on this death call at the end of my shift. I text back. I'll be getting there around the same time. Let yourself in. Make yourself a drink. 40 minutes went by really quick, but it wasn't because of the thrilling conversation. In fact, Andy is making me super uncomfortable. He's telling me about his gastric bypass surgery and how he used to weigh almost 500 pounds. He's down to about 205 now. I, I think. I don't know. I genuinely don't care. For most of our ride, Andy is telling me how he always empathizes with people in Mr. Ross's condition because he was almost there himself. I try to make it clear to Andy that I'm not interested in this conversation by staring out the window and being mostly absent when he looks to me for a response. I mean, Andy told me how he could barely wipe his own butt and how he couldn't see his own penis without a mirror. Those two overshares alone are enough to make me toss up my lunch on this dashboard. Why the fuck am I here right now listening to this? Oh. That's right, because one of Alan's dumb kids had to fall off a jungle gym and go to the hospital. It's 5.51. I should be finishing my second drink and hopping into the shower getting ready for Mary by now, but I'm not. I'm in the middle of nowhere looking for a giant man with a guy who can't stop telling me how he used to also be a giant man. <sighs> Andy pulls into a mobile home complex. Some folks might refer to it as a trailer park. I find that term to be a bit pejorative in this case. These double-wide manufactured homes aren't bad at all. This must be a trailer park with some sort of homeowners association. Everything is really clean and none of the homes are in any major disrepair. We make our first left inside the community and are greeted by a sad looking crowd of about 20 people standing in front of one of the trailers. Most of which have a lit cigarette hanging out of their mouths and at least one piece of NASCAR apparel on. A hat, shirt, socks. It's almost like they have a dress code here. Andy and I wave to the people and look for a house number as we inch closer. 6785. That's our house. As we pull forward, we see a giant hole in the side of the trailer by a large metal ramp. There's a king-size white bed sheet flapping in the wind covering most of the large hole. I may be going out on a limb here, but I think this is our house. Andy parks and goes inside to meet with the family. I'm sitting in the car and quietly listening to my stomach growl and plot against me. Andy is in the house for about five minutes before he comes out and gets me in our makeshift stretcher from the van. We place the wood base of the container onto the heavyweight graded church truck we brought with us and it's actually a lot more sturdy than I imagined. Andy points to the ramp near the sheet covered hole in the house and says, that's where we're heading. Before we start walking, Andy tells the crowd that they should wait by the van. We have some people inside that'll help us place Mr. Ross's body in the container, but anyone is welcome to help us assist in loading him into the van. Andy and I politely smile at the 20 or so sad faces and begin our quick walk up the ramp. When we get to the top of the ramp and break the crest into the bedroom, we see our man. He's hard to miss. He's laying in what appears to be a king-size reclinable hospital bed with four thick steel rods running floor to ceiling where the bed's posts would normally be. Above the bed, there are five large girders with an electronic lift system and controller installed. This must be how they move them. How does this double wide hold up all the metal supports plus the weight of Mr. Ross's body? I guess these trailer homes are built more substantially than I thought. It's a little weird when you're more intrigued by the home medical infrastructure than the 700 pound dead body plopped right in front of you. Aside from being the biggest person I had ever seen, he was just another dead body, but like really big. 
rolls and rolls of overlapping fat. His arms and legs looked like an adult man version of a Sharpe puppy. He was shirtless and had a white top sheet covering his body up to just below his nipples. He looked like he was sleeping. He didn't look like he was in any pain or any sort of real anguish. He looks like his body just decided to freeze him in a peaceful, easy state of stillness. His expression reminds me of my moment I had outside earlier after I clocked out this afternoon. Was the look on my face before Andy called me as relaxed and as peaceful as Mr. Ross's? We get closer to the body and a smell creeps into my nose. It's a combination of B.O., piss, shit, and sweaty, dirty fabric. I'm assuming all of these smells are coming from our friend, Mr. Ross. The family is actually very helpful, and they instruct us on how to use the strap suspended from the lift. This lift is super handy. We'll be able to lift them straight up and down into our shipping container. That's about as straightforward as a death call gets. I'm pretty eager to exert as little energy as possible. When we start to roll Mr. Ross's shirtless body, we can see giant open bed sores on his back, oozing oily water and pus. The smell is almost unbearable. I look at Andy and his facial expression is letting me know he smells it too. Once the straps are underneath the man and he's secured, a family member grabs the controller for the lift. Are you guys ready? We give him a nod and Mr. Ross's 700 pound body slowly lifts off the bed. The heavy duty nylon straps are absorbed into the man's rolls of fat. The wind coming in from the large hole in the house circulates the smells ruminating from under the body. Everyone in the room can smell it, but everyone in the room is too polite to cough or gag even though we'd all love to right now. The lift stops at its max height and Andy and I move the container under his body. The girders and steel rods creak under the stress. It's ominous. It's what I imagine the inside of the Titanic sounded like when it was sinking. Well, a little less dramatic than that, I suppose. I hope this double wide doesn't fold in on itself and kill all of us inside. That would be an awful way to go. Imagine the headlines. Two funeral home employees and others killed by morbidly obese man in tragic double wide collapse. Almost as quickly as we got the container under the man's body, the controller began lowering him. I feel like he must have heard the creaks too and wanted to expedite this process. Mr. Ross touches the bottom of the container and the nylon straps become slack. He's in and secure. When we disconnected the straps and pulled them out from under the body, they were covered in a fresh coating of whatever fluids were leaking out of this man's body. I gag a little when I see this. We cover the man with the container's top and make the bed, covering the giant discolored damp spot from the body before we gather his friends to help us down the ramp and into the car. It's already a pretty awkward situation. You don't really want his friends to see the mess he left. Remember, even though Mr. Ross is dead, we still need to make sure we protect his dignity. Andy gathers the crowd to help. I gotta tell ya, it's a lot nicer to make a removal with 20 people in a home than it is just Andy and I. We barely had to do a thing except tell them what to do. It was great. It's crazy how quickly it went. Two minutes after the body was in the container, it was placed in the back of the van. Mr. Ross rolled smoothly out of the house and down the ramp. It was incredible and completely unexpected. I imagined at least one thing going wrong tonight. The chassis of the van is almost touching the back wheels because of the extra weight of the body, so we have to drive a little more carefully on the way back. This is fine by me. The more calmly Andy drives, the more likely I am to get over this upset stomach. As we drove off with Mr. Ross, the crowd of his friends and family waved until we got to the end of the road and turned out of sight. The ride into town was slow, but by the time we got back, my stomach was almost settled and I could feel myself getting hungry again. I wonder if Mr. Ross ever had a barbecue rib sandwich from a gas station. I'm sure he had to have. He's 700 pounds. He must have at least tried one at some point, right? Andy and I arrive back at the crematory and using our hydraulic lift, we're able to easily move the body out of the van and place him right in front of the crematorium on a loading lift. Andy tells me that we'll be able to cremate first thing Monday morning, so we'll just leave him here. It'll make it a lot easier. He tells me he'll lock up and I can take off. It's 6.45. Mary will be at my house in 15 minutes. This is perfect timing. I think I'm actually going to get a relaxing night with Mary, my dog Carter, and PlayStation 2's Guitar Hero. I need this. I'm almost home and Mary texts me that she got to my house a little early and let Carter out to go potty. I smile and think about the wonderful drunken time we're about to have and how I won't have to see another dead body or Mr. Ross again until Monday. Thank Christ. 
I'm about a mile from my house when a terrible taste fills my mouth and my stomach contracts and growls viciously. I panic. I'm so close to home and I'm either about to shit my pants or puke all over my car. I can feel my body begin some sort of final countdown emergency evacuation procedure. I have about three minutes before I have a huge mess on my hands. Oh, damn barbecue sandwiches. Why did I have to push it and eat four this week? Why couldn't I just be an adult and eat regular food? I roll down the windows to let the cool October air in and push my foot down on the gas pedal. Okay, I just need to run to the bathroom as soon as I walk in the door. Mary will just think I'm in a hurry and have to pee or something. Then I can get whatever's in my body out and then spend time with Mary without her ever knowing any of the gross details. I pull into my driveway, park, and get out running. I burst into the kitchen through the garage door and quickly dash over to the sink where I unload the contents of my stomach. Mostly semi-digested pieces of barbecue rib sandwich mixed with the brown liquid. I'm assuming that's coffee. After the initial heaving and all the food was out of my body, I dry heave for about two minutes. I'm sweating now. I look over my shoulder and see that Mary's been sitting at the kitchen table nibbling on a Caesar salad that she brought with her from school. She sat completely still and in shock. From the look on her face, it's clear that I just ruined her meal and made her lose her appetite. And it sucked because I didn't just throw up once. I threw up all night. Mary left after an hour of watching me puke into a toilet while laying on my bathroom floor in my underwear. I could tell she was annoyed but not mad. She thought I had the flu. I mean, it could have been the flu, but I'll venture a guess that it was those sandwiches paired with complete sleep depravity. I was actually sicker than I've ever been in my life for a day and a half. I promised myself laying on the bathroom floor that evening that I would only eat a balanced and healthy diet from now on. If I didn't start now, I was going to either be dead at 22 or as a morbidly obese person 20 years from now. It wasn't fun being that sick, but by Sunday evening, the pooch that I was so worried about Thursday and Friday had shrunk. And even though I was sick, I was relieved that the pooch I had was more than likely caused by whatever was in my digestive system, not a spare tire filled with candy bars, cheap burgers, and energy drinks. I went to bed at 5.15 on Sunday night and didn't wake up until my alarm went off at 7.15 the next morning. It's 9 a.m. Monday morning. I feel amazing. I stopped puking Saturday afternoon and have been resting and rehydrating ever since. I feel really bad that Mary planned to spend her Friday night with me and I completely ruined it by puking all over the kitchen. She wasn't mad at all when I talked to her on Saturday. She said everyone gets sick, you're just run down. Thank God I found a girl like Mary. She watched me puke up a barbecue rib sandwich and whatever else I had that day and still wants to date me. I'm at the crematory cremating Mr. Ross right now. He was a pain in the ass to get inside the retort. Andy just left. It took two of us pushing with all of our strength to get Mr. Ross off the hydraulic lift and into the machine. About 40 minutes into his cremation, all of the emergency shutoff indicators started flashing and the machine went into automatic shutdown procedure. An alarm bell rang on the side of the machine. I've never heard this before. Having never encountered this alarm before, I panicked and called my dad. I said, Dad. The machine shut down and there's an alarm going off. What do I do? My dad told me to calm down and explain to me something very fascinating about our cremation machine. If someone has a lot of fat on their body, the fat will actually ignite and burn way hotter than a slender body. Once the air inside the retort reaches a certain temperature, the machine will turn off its main flame thrusters and let the body cremate itself. Calories burning calories. When the main blower and flame is off, you can actually hear the fat crackling inside the brick-lined retort. It sounds just like crackling bacon, in case you were wondering. Speaking of, I'm starting to get a little hungry. My dad reassured me that I did nothing wrong and the flames in the blower would turn back on once the temperature was cool enough inside. He was right. It turned back on in about 15 minutes. So about a half hour later, Mr. Ross was well on his way to being fully cremated. Thankfully, the machine was running smoothly again at a cooler temperature, so I could finally get out of here and grab something to eat before I run back to the funeral home to help set up for an afternoon funeral service before coming back here to process and pulverize what's left of Mr. Ross's 700-pound body into a plastic bag held shut with a zip tie. It's amazing what a small package we can turn this 700-pound body into. 
I had every intention of going to Giovanni's for lunch and having one of their famous giant Italian chop salads. It's all fresh produce and homemade dressing. It's delicious, and I'm sure it's a little bit better for me than those sick bomb barbecue sandwiches I stuffed my face with all last week. On the way to Giovanni's, my phone rings. It's my dad. We just got a death call, and he needs me to get back to the funeral home as soon as possible to man the phones and finish setting up for the afternoon service. I reluctantly asked if I had time for lunch. He said, not really, just grab something on your way back. I turn around and head back to the funeral home, passing the crematory on my way. I wonder how much longer Mr. Ross will take to be reduced to ash and bone. With as hot as he was burning earlier, I'd say he'll be done in 90 minutes. It's incredible what a gross yet effective cremation accelerant human fat is. My stomach growls. I need to eat. But the only place to stop on the way back to the funeral home is a gas station. Damn it. So much for a balanced, healthy diet. I pull in and park. When I walk into the gas station, I'm greeted by my old friend, the barbecue rib sandwich sitting in an open-faced refrigerator with a sign that says two for 222. Now, even though these sandwiches made me sick, I still kind of want one, but you know what? No, I promised myself on the bathroom floor in between fits of sickness the other night that I would do everything in my power to treat my body with the respect it deserves so my organs don't give up on me like Mr. Ross's body gave out on him. This body is the only vessel connecting me to this world that I have, and I need to take care of it and love my body with the things I put in it. So that day, I had a gas station salad. My name is Grant, and these are my funeral home stories. Thank you for listening to my funeral home stories. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please rate and review wherever you listen. It actually helps out a lot more than you think. Be sure to follow me on social media, at Pomo and Kitsch. And also check out my album, Pomo and Kitsch, Fetch. Also available on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, or wherever you listen to music. Thanks for listening. <laughs>